It's a joy to be with you all tonight, and again, thank you for your greeting, and you just make people feel at home, you know, and uh, I, I like that. I like that about your church. You got a special thing going on here. Don't miss it. I don't go to sleep. There's something special happening at Faith Baptist Church, and thank you for allowing me the privilege to come down and meet you all. And uh, of course, I, my wife sends her apologies that she can't be here, and I know you understand. I really appreciate many of you have come up to me, and the first thing you say to me is you ask me about my wife. You've never met her, but you're praying for her, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. Such a comfort, and she's doing well. She's had a good day today, and God is helping us along this journey of faith. And then, of course, you didn't get to meet my little two-and-a-half-year-old, but I promise you she's a little live wire. She's a lot of fun. And one day we'll get to all fellowship together again, whether it's here or in the air. We'll have a good time together, and we'll sing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Amen. And that will be a special day. Again, my name's Daniel. You've met me, many of you have met me already. And then my wife is Rachel, and our little daughter is Ruby. And then we got a little boy on the way still trying to decide on a name. But we are excited to present to you our ministry to the nation of England, which is my home. And I'm so grateful that God allowed me the privilege to grow up on the mission field. So let me do this. We're going to go, Brother Josh, straight into the video. And then afterwards, I'll get up and I'll comment on a few things. And then we'll take a minute for questions if you have a question about our work and what the Lord is calling us to do. Thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. England, a nation full of ancient history, rolling hills, majestic lakes, breathtaking coastlines, enduring traditions, and unique cultures. While geographically a small nation, similar to the size of Alabama, yet due to the impact of the British Empire, there are over 250 people groups living within its borders, including many from countries who are not yet open to the gospel. The people of England desperately need the light of Christ in a nation that is getting darker and ever more distant from him. Hi, my name is Daniel Soule, and this is my beautiful wife, Rachel, along with our little princess, Ruby. God has allowed us the opportunity to be the second generation of Soult missionaries to the nation of England. At the age of four, my father led me to Christ. While growing up, I was privileged to join in multiple ministries with my parents, including church planning, soul winning, children's programs, and teen activities. After graduating high school, I enrolled in Hiles Anderson College with the goal of developing a media career. It was during the missions conference my freshman year, God spoke to me and revealed his perfect plan for my life. Matthew 14, 17 through 19 says, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. Christ's response to Andrew turned my plans upside down. Following his lead, I surrendered my life to him, changed my college major to missions, and began the path to serve him full-time in the mission field. Rachel was born and raised in the beautiful state of Montana. At the age of 17, Rachel got her salvation settled. She surrendered her life to the Lord in 2014 at a summer teen camp. It was also the same year that she felt God's leading to attend Hiles Anderson College. God brought us together during our first semester of college, and a few months after graduation, we got married. Shortly before Ruby was born, God allowed us the opportunity to visit England. I was able to experience the culture that Daniel grew up in and connect with many sweet Christians. We were able to visit the church family, go soul winning, and Daniel was able to preach at his parents' church. While on our trip, God gave peace to both our hearts that this is where he wants us to serve him with our lives. Upon returning to England, we will be serving at my parents' church in Preston, England, a city with a surrounding population of over 200,000 people. Lord willing, we plan on building a children and teen program along with participating in outreach, discipleship, media efforts, and other avenues that God has yet to reveal to us. Please pray for God's protection on our lives while on deputation and also that we will be able to be a blessing to churches along the way. God is truly good to us and we are so thankful and blessed to be on his missionary journey. Thank you for being a light in your part of the world and beyond. May God richly bless you.
This past July, we were able to take a two-week trip back to England, and the first week we were there, we were able to help our church there do a vacation Bible school, and in England, we call it Holiday Bible Club. And we had the themed crafts, snacks, games, Bible lessons, songs, everything you would expect in a vacation Bible school. We just did that in England. We had a penny offering and it was fantastic. Uh, there's just an energy right now in that church and people are coming from left and right and there's a lot of young children that are in the church. And we were excited to see 48 children attend the Holiday Bible Club over the five day stretch that we had it and 14 of those children accepted Christ as their Savior and the quality of young people that came they were just amazing very attentive um, very obedient to instruction and we just had a great time with them and of course we can't wait to get back and just continue to do the work that the Lord has called us to do the guys in the sound booth and put getting that ready to go and there's a little glimpse of what God is already doing and we just can't wait to get back and be a part of that ministry and see what God does past that point as well but there's a lie that's being sold Satan's selling a lie in our western world he's trying to sell in Tennessee that God is done with us here in America and in Europe in western Europe and eastern Europe that's a lie God's still working his spirit is still here. There's still a job to do. There's still a purpose in why we were created. There's potential to fulfill. And it's exciting to see that God is still working in England. Yes, a very dark nation. Yes, there are many challenges. But there is an open door right now to the gospel. And we're excited to walk through that open door. And when you look at that nation, 48% of them would claim to be a Christian. It's a name tag that they wear. Yet 1% of our population attend church on a regular basis. In our nation, we're down to about 30% in recent news that I just read an article last Sunday. That's where we are. England's at 1%. And how many of that 1% are truly born-again Christians? The answer is very few. And, of course, the challenges of humanism, secular ideology, materialism, Islam have made things challenging in that nation, made the ground a little hard. But I'm so glad. Gospel light still punches through. You just got to keep giving out tracts. You got to keep speaking to people. Got to go out soul winning. Put John and Romans indoors. And you know what? The English will get saved. It's just a lot of work. Pray and work. And that's all we can do. Last year, the ministry that my dad's pastoring saw 180 people accept Christ. And that just goes to show there is fertile ground still in England. We just got to keep going and finding them. And it's nice to see Brother Caleb Tooley back here. His dad has also been in England about six months longer than my parents. And they also see the same thing, just working in the, in the field, and you'll see souls saved. It just takes a lot of work. And we're excited to go back and work with these people. And yes, reach the English people, but as has been mentioned to me throughout my stay here with you, many of you have brought up to me the fact that it's a multicultural company country and yes it is uh, you can reach the world through England right now they've all moved in and they're coming from Pakistan from India you saw the video right there we're very diverse and of course there's the loss of national identity and all that comes with that but on the flip side you do see an open door for the gospel and Pakistani Protestants moving to England fleeing persecution they are our low-hanging fruit right now they are very hungry for the gospel if someone would just tell them and then the openings that we have to reach these people in a safe nation like England and then get back into India, get back into Pakistan, get back into Nigeria, it's, it's becoming possible. We recently had a man from Ethiopia. He floated on a raft, came over the English Channel, claimed asylum, fleeing persecution, and he's now part of our church. And so God's just bringing people from all around the world. We pray for laborers. He sends them from Pakistan, and it's great. And we can work with them to reach the, our people, but then also reach back into those places. So if you give me in prayers for our family, our goals, our desire is to get back and work with that church that my dad's currently pastoring. They run anywhere between 80 to 90 on a Sunday. It's a thriving work, a lot going on. They're growing. And so we hope to add energy to that work. I love how in the book of Ezra, the last verse of chapter 8, the Bible talks about how Ezra furthered the work. And that's what our desire to do for our first few years of ministry is to further what God is already doing.
start a Bible institute, start training the nationals. Uh, I was excited to hear, I was speaking to my dad this week, of people freshly saved going out soul winning, but they need training. They need someone to teach them a little bit more on confrontational soul winning. So we need to add some energy in that department, of course, and a team program. And then after a few years of helping that church out, we're praying over cities nearby that we would like to start a church in. Uh, how many of you recently heard about the stabbings that occurred over in England? There was a horrible attack. Three children lost their lives. It was just devastating. It was the city of Southport. Southport is only 30 minutes from where our family is ministering in England, just 30 minutes away. And in fact, that is a city, 95,000 people, that I've been praying over as a place to go start a church. It's very interesting that that would occur. That has never happened. In 26 years, people were saying, I've lived here 26 years. I've never seen such horrible crime, uh, horrible crime committed. It's interesting. Our society is further declining, and they truly need the word of God in their homes. They need it in their lives. They need to be born again, and maybe God's opening up a door in Southport. So could you pray for our family? Uh, we've raised 89% of our support. That represents 69 different churches across our nation. We've traveled almost to 47 different states. By the end of the year, it'll be 47. And God has helped us along the way. We need about 11 more supporting churches, and we'll be good to go. And God is taking good care of all that. And if you could be in prayer for our travels, pray, please pray for my wife, of course. And uh, there are concerns with the pregnancy, and uh, we need to get her into a safe place. She's at a safe place right now, but we're going to try to move back to where she's from in Montana and try to have a safe trip out there so she can be with family while I accomplish meetings if I'm able to do that. So if you could be in prayer for that, that God would give me wisdom, give us strength and health for our little one to come, our little boy, and if you could pray for our family in that area. We had set tickets. We already had booked tickets for November 26. We were heading to England. We were excited for that. Uh, but his ways are higher than mine, and God knew. And so now we're looking at April 10th. We're going to move our tickets to that date. We're starting our visa on that date. So if you could be in prayer that in April we'd be able to smoothly depart to the country, all the paperwork would be in order with our next son on the way and everything that's involved with that. Um, of course, we have prayer cards on the back table. We have prayer magnets if you would like to grab one of those and remember to pray for our family. I, I really just want to say, before I get into questions, thank you for allowing me the privilege to share that with you. And thank you, Pastor, for opening up your home and getting to spend time with you and your dear wife. And then also, you're welcome here. Thank you for the generous love offering and taking care of my expenses driving down here. We greatly appreciate that. You're helping us get to the next place. So before we get into the message tonight, does anyone have a question? Anyone have a question concerning my home? concerning the state of, of England. England's only about 30 years of where America is going. So going around the room, if you don't have a question, Brother Caleb back there, he attends church. You can get him later. I'll put you on the spot, brother. Going once, going twice. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Thank you for hearing about my family's burden and our ministry, and I appreciate your prayers that you've already been praying and we are very sincerely grateful for that. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Tonight the title of the message is Finishing with Joy. Finishing with Joy. How can you and I finish with joy? I love the Apostle Paul and his account in Scripture, don't you? It's it Really, it's a neat story how God had changed his life. And it's the same for each and every one of us. We have been changed We've been born again. When we accept Christ's salvation, the light comes on and our life is forever changed. And the thing ha that happened to Paul. And we see his account recorded here. Luke did his diligence to record the man Paul and to learn about his life. And Luke recorded this, um, basically, this encounter between Paul and a group of friends, a group of Christian brothers. And they had gathered together at Miletus, and Paul had um, spoken some words to them that ring true today, and I believe they can be an encouragement to us in our day. How can you and I, in 2024, in whatever time we have, how can you and I finish with joy? We'll look at that tonight. Look with me in verse 22, and we're going to read three verses. I'll pray, and then we'll get into the meat of the message. The Bible says in verse 22 of Acts chapter 20, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, 
neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Can we pray? Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for Faith Baptist Church, and thank you for this moment in time, this moment in, of, in eternity, when we can look at your word, Lord, and see the truths that are hidden therein. I pray you'd bring them out tonight, Lord. I pray you'd set me aside. I earnestly plead that, that you'd set me aside, and I want to be an empty suit for you as I convey the message from your word. Speak to my heart, Lord. Grab me, shake me. Bring me back to the point where I realize that I need to keep my eyes on you, finishing with joy. Thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul. May we all leave encouraged tonight as we go into yet another week of living a life for you. Thank you for the electricity. Thank you that that came back on and we're in this comfortable place. I pray you now you'd use this time to glorify your son. In your name I pray. Amen. Pastor Campbell, thank you for the opportunity to stand behind your pulpit. I sincerely count this as an honor, and I thank you, church family, for the opportunity to share God's word with you. We see here Paul speaking to these men, telling them, look, I know trouble's ahead. None of us like trouble. Does anyone like trouble? <laughs> None of us like trouble. Trouble's ahead, but I'm determined to finish with joy. We're going to look at the context so we better understand the, the passage and let's go back to verse 16 of chapter 20, please. We'll jump back a little bit, and then we'll go back up to verse 24. The Bible says in verse 16 of Acts chapter 20, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And of course, Paul is returning back to Jerusalem. He's bringing a group of men with him. They've collected up an offering to give to the struggling, persecuted church of Jerusalem. And Paul's determined, I'm going to be there at this day. And what we can see in Scripture with Paul, if he made his mind up to do something, he's going to do his utmost to fulfill it. And he doesn't want to take any sidetracks. You know, he doesn't want to get off the beaten path. He wants to keep moving forward to get to Jerusalem before, uh, on that day of Pentecost and to be there for that moment. So verse 17, you find him in the port city of Miletus. And Miletus, like I said, is a port city that was there next to Ephesus. So what he asked the elders to do is to come and meet him at that port city so that way he could continue his journey. Uh, Ephesus was a sweet place in his heart. He had spent, many theologians believe, a, a good chunk of his ministry, two years, the longest period of time, in that city. He had formed a relationship with those Christians. And if he went in and got in with fellowship with them, he probably would miss his appointment. And he wants to still see them, but he also wants to get to Jerusalem. So they come over to Miletus in verse 17. And the Bible says, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Verse 18, we see the beginning of the conversation. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Of course, he's referencing his testimony, and Paul had lived a real life. Thank God for real Christians. We can read about stories of faith in Scripture. We can hear about George Miller, as we did from the pulpit this morning, and we can read those biographies and read about missionaries that went to Africa, what God did in their lives. And yes, we should do that. We should reference Hebrews chapter 11, and we should learn from their lives, as we are learning from Paul right now in his life. But there's something special about flesh and blood, isn't it? Someone who's been real in your life. How many of you, just out of curiosity, you're here at Faith Baptist Church, or you got saved because of someone that was close to you, a friend, a family? To, who would raise their hand and say, that was me? I got saved because of a close friend, family member who, got me, uh, who led me to Christ, got me into church. Many of you raised your hands. It's connections, right? People we know. 
People that we saw Jesus in them, and they led us to the Savior, told us about him. That's a special thing. So Paul references that. He references how he taught them. He didn't hold anything back. There was no impartiality about the Apostle Paul. He fought. He, he pleaded. He, he wrote uh, epistles and, and pleaded for the impartiality of the gospel, how it goes to the Jew and to the Greek, as verse 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody has to have an opportunity to hear. Amen? Everyone deserves an opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus Christ. The greatest sin that mankind can make is a rejection of the cross of Christ. They need to hear. They need to make, have that decision put in front of them. Verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Like I said at the beginning of the message, he knew that trouble was ahead. The Holy Ghost had impressed on his heart that he's going to go into a period of persecution once again. Now, Paul was no stranger to persecution. At the beginning of his ministry, he had to be lowered out of a basket on the wall there's walls of Damascus and flee persecution because they were lying in wait to kill him all the way at the beginning. Uh, he had always been uh, undergoing that. So he's no stranger to this. But I don't believe Paul is giddy as he writes verse 24. I don't think he's just anxious to get in, into the persecution. I'm sure... There's gonna, he, he's feeling the pain, and he's feeling the beatings, and he's, he's feeling the stoning that they left him for dead, and he remembers all that. But with that in mind, he then still writes verse 24. I love this. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He's going to preach the gospel, and he's excited about moving forward in that. But he's going to finish with joy. The word joy in the Greek, that word joy right there is the word kara, which means calm delight. That's the meaning of that word, kara, the calm delight. Paul says, I want to finish in that calm delight only found by serving Christ. And you and I can have that today. But I want to bring up something first before we get into the application. How do I finish with joy? I'll, there'll be two points at the end of the message that will sum things up and we'll come to a decision. But can I address tonight that there's a false joy that's promoted in our world today? There's a false joy that many Christians find themselves living for today. And it's the false joy that, this, that is promoted around our world. We'll look at the first uh, false joy tonight, and that is um, the, the false joy of circumstantial happiness. Can I start off by saying tonight that joy is not circumstantial happiness? It is certainly not. Paul says in this instance, look, I'm going to go into persecutions and afflictions, and I'm going to be going into trouble but I'm still going to finish with joy. That's not circumstantial happiness, my friend. Turn with me, chapter 26. Can, I want you to see this. Let's move over to chapter 26. Joy is not circumstantial happiness. Paul says, I'm going to, I want to finish with joy. I'm determined in that. In chapter 26, you find Paul standing before King Agrippa. Now he's standing literally in the trial. Now he's standing to answer for his life. I believe at this point, Paul knew that his end was somewhere down the road. He was going to be executed. He knew that day was coming. And it's, it's, it's going to happen. And so he's standing. He's, able to, he's been given an audience before the king, and he's not going to waste any time. Verse 1 of chapter 26, I want you to see the spirit and the attitude of the apostle Paul. The Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself saying these words, these four words in verse 2, I think myself happy, <laughs> King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews. I'm so happy for this opportunity. I'm so happy for this trial that I'm in, where I get an opportunity to speak to you about Jesus. Why? Because Paul's determined he's going to finish in that calm delight. He's going to finish with joy. Let's look at another example. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. Let's look at another, another group of people who also had that same spirit, 
who also had that determination, that calm delight about them. Chapter 5, you, you, we find Peter and the apostles. Now they're standing before the uh, Sanhedrin. They're standing before the council that day. And they are under a, also a trial. They're on trial. And they're being told, you're not allowed to preach about Jesus being the Messiah. You need to be quiet now. This is, we need to stop this conversation and try to squelch this. Verse 29, we, we love this verse because Peter stands up boldly of chapter 5, verse 29. He says this, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I would just love to see that, you know, that image. It would be so cool if we could roll the tape back. Well, one day in heaven, we'll, we'll see that image where Peter's standing strong. And here you have these men around him, the disciples, and said, no. You tell us not to preach about Jesus? Well, we ought to obey God rather than men. In our country, there's going to come a day very soon where you and I are going to have to take that stand. I believe in my generation, we're going to have to take that stand. Are we going to be silent? Yes, we'll, we'll still speak the truth in love, but sin is sin. No getting around it. We all need a savior. Someone's going to need to take a stand. Peter and the uh, disciples took a stand. And Peter actually preached, uh, if you move forward uh, through verse, 30 for th verse 32, he points out to the fact that they crucified Jesus. They crucified their Messiah. So he preaches at them. They hear his return. In verse 33, this is their response. The Bible says, and when they heard that, the council, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Here you have this these group of Christians standing up strong for the Lord, now they have a death sentence upon them. There's a mob mentality happening in that room where these councilmen want to kill the disciples. They're so enraged. Of course, if you reread further, uh, verse 34, Gamaliel stands up and he forms an argument. And it's a very well laid out argument talking about false messiahs of the past. And if this is of God... This will peter, uh, if this is not of God, it will peter out. But this is of God. Oh, we better not stand against him. We're, we're up against God. And he brings that argument before the council. And I know I'm paraphrasing. I want to keep moving forward in the message tonight. And he ends with this uh, thought in verse 38. So this is Gamaliel speaking to the council with the disciples there. He says this to the council, verse 38. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Aren't you glad this is not of men? That's the biggest offense we have today. Somebody wants to get in your face and say that you, you're lowly or you're, you're foolish to believe the teachings of Jesus Christ. We have a resurrected Savior, my friend. He rose up from the grave he rose. Don't ever, don't ever get far from the resurrection and the importance of that. We have a resurrected Savior. And it still continues on to this day. The, the church of Jesus Christ is moving forward. The Holy Spirit is still here. So, verse 39. But if it be of God, this is Gamaliel, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Verse 40 is their response. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they command, uh, commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. These men went, underwent a beating. They underwent some persecution at this moment. I don't know about you, but I've never been in a beating for standing for Jesus. I've never. Uh, now, there are people in this world right now that are undergoing persecution and beatings. And they are being attacked. And there's a special place under the throne of God for those people that are going to die for his name. That is happening. These men went through that persecution. They went through that beating. But this is what was their spirit. I want, you, I want you to see this in verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. These men left that room after a beating, rejoicing that they suffered for Jesus. Joy is not, my friend, it's not circumstantial happiness. What we got to be careful of 
in our lives is that we're not living for the next pleasureful moment. We're living for the eternal, my friend. I don't, you know, circumstantial happiness is great. Our, our first wedding anniversary, we came down to this area, and we had a cabin outside Pigeon Forge, and we had a great time. And, and when I heard the rain last night, it was bringing back memories of that wonderful time, my wife and I, our first wedding anniversary. That was great. I love that circumstantial happiness in that moment. I love a bowl of ice cream. How about you? Uh, Pastor and I were looking at the red velvet cake today, and it was about this tall, quite literally. And that, that's a lot of circumstantial happiness right there. That's great. But my friend, that's not what we should be living for. That next moment, that next vacation. In England, it's holiday. They all live for their holidays. They're all, when you talk to the English, you don't talk about work. You don't relate in that way. Uh, it's not kids, usually. It's about the next holiday. They're living for that next moment. And as Christians, we got to be careful. We can't be living for the next pleasureful moment. We're living for the eternal not what this world can offer us. What we're, we're seeking, as Hebrews said, we're seeking a, a better country. That's where we are pilgrims on a journey. We can't forget that. This world is not our home. So joy is not circumstantial happiness. Don't, let's, let's not live for that. Secondly, joy is not self-generated. It is not something that I can pull out of this flesh. It is not something in the old nature. Joy is given to you and I by God. It is a fruit of the Spirit. As Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 through 25 speaks of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's given to us by God. That's when we submit to him and we walk in the Spirit every day. And then we can experience that joy. It's not something, what I want to point out, it's not something that you have to pull out of yourself. Thank God. It's given to us by him. Thirdly, joy is not self-centered. It's not pleasing, my friend, to our flesh. It doesn't please this rotten old nature. Turn with me John chapter 15, please. John chapter 15. I want to bring this out to you. John chapter 15. We all love, I'm sure, John 15, 11. I'm going to read it to you very quickly. John 15, 11. Thank you for turning with me. We've got a few more pages to turn in, but I want you to see this. What joy is not? Joy is not circumstantial happiness. Joy is not self-generated. Joy is not self-centered, my friend. It's for others. Verse, uh, verse 11 of John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. That sounds wonderful. You want that joyful life? Who wants that joyful life? You want that joyful life? Let's read back a little bit then, because we need to understand these things. Let's go back to verse 6, uh, verse 5, actually. Let's, let's move back a little bit. Christ said this, John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Oh, we got to get to know him. I hope you got that this morning in the message that Pastor brought to us. We got to get to know our Savior. We need to understand and, and get to have a relationship with him. If we don't do that, we've already failed. So what does getting to know Jesus, what does abiding in Jesus look like? We'll skip forward to verse 7. The Bible says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Stop. That's a time in the word, my friend, quite, quite simply. It's a time in the word. It's a time that we feed and we meditate on the word of God and we get to better know our Savior. When is that time for you? Bible, uh, Christ told Satan that mankind's not going to live by bread alone, right? But by every word. We're supposed to feed off this word. Just like Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. We need to feed on it on a regular basis, not just the Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. If we treated our bodies like that, I would be a lot skinnier than I am today. Deputation would be no struggle in that department. But many of us, we treat our physical bodies well, but our spiritual state, we are not treating well. We're actually undergoing spiritual malnutrition. Can I encourage you? Spend time in the word of God. Abide in Christ. Go back to verse 7, John 15, 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. We're talking about how joy is not self-centered or self-pleasing. You know what's really hard to do? Maybe you struggle just like me, but it is to truly pray. 
to spend time with our Lord, to walk with him in the garden, to get to know him, to bring my requests and my praises before God. I don't know about you, but I close my eyes in prayer, and all of a sudden I think about the coffee I left in the microwave or the fact that I forgot to pay this bill and I need to go do that. How many of you have ever been that, like that? Or is it just me? seems like all the distractions of life come into one's mind. Why? Because it's a battle, my friend, to truly pray. It doesn't please our flesh. It pleases God. It helps us get to know him. It's our most powerful weapon that we have to abide in Christ. Though time in the word and in time in prayer. It's not self-centered, my friend. It doesn't please our flesh. Moving forward, what else is not self-centered? Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. You and I as Christians want to be known as the disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, amen? Then we have a responsibility to go forth and bear forth much fruit. As John 4, 38, Christ talked about how, say not ye there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. There's a job to do right now. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. So that be, so that, I'm paraphrasing, but he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. There's a sharing that happens. One sows, another reaps. We have that responsibility. But we want a John 15, 11 life. We want a joyful life. A time in the word, a time in prayer, and a time to tell others. Very hard to do, isn't it? Oh, it's just, I don't know about you, but I evaluate situations. Are they truly ready? Are they in the right state of mind? We must just go and tell and let God do the work. And before you, you know what? You may be surprised, as I was a couple weeks ago. I met a guy walking his dog. You think, oh, he's walking his dog. He's got to take his dog, you know, to do his doggy business and go home. He's too busy. Oh, that man, he stood right there and he said, you know what? I prayed last night and I asked the Lord. His name's David. I asked the Lord that I needed help. I said, Lord, help me. And then you're here to speak to me today. Surprise, surprise. That man got saved that day. Just go. We just got to go. Daniel Soul needs to stop evaluating his situation and just go. That doesn't please the flesh, does it? We wrestle with it. We must die to that and move forward for him. How about loving the unlovable, as John 15, uh, 9 speaks of? As the Father hath loved me, even, uh, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Of course, we read John 15, 11, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's selfless love. It doesn't come naturally to us, does it? It's hard to love and not receive love back in return. Anyone struggle in that department? I do. Loving the unlovable but we are commanded to do so. One of John 15, 11 life, these things. You know what? That's not self-centered happiness, my friend. That's living a life for others. You know what else joy is not? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'll give you one more argument in this area, and then we'll move into application, and then we'll wrap up the message. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Joy is not circumstantial happiness. Joy is not self-generated. Joy is not self, uh, self-centered, self-pleasing. Joy is not Finally, it is not short-lived. It is not short-lived. Hebrews chapter 12. Oh, don't you love verse 1, verse 2, verse 3? Whew, gives me, gives me goosebumps as I read this passage. Verse 1, wherefore, Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews, uh, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Of course, the witnesses are speaking of those in chapter 11, looking at their, of their examples. They, they're people with a sin nature that struggle just like you and I, yet they're recorded as heroes of faith. We can look at that. We can look forward, running with patience the race that is set before us. Then, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, 
that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners uh, against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Does that mean our Lord, as he walked up Calvary's road, was giddy, was gleeful, as he bore that cross? as he took the stripes for you and I, as they hung him up, as he went for that moment of separation when God the Father turned his back because my sin and your sin was put upon Jesus Christ, that moment in eternity, he could have called down the angels, yet he willingly went as a lamb to the slaughter and he died for you and I. What is the joy of Hebrews 12 too? What is the joy? You and I accepting him. He died for us. He wants us with him in heaven. He paid our penalty, my friend. We're justified. Just as just if, if I never sinned. Whew. That's how God the Father looks at us because of what the Son did. Wow, what a Savior. And that's not short-lived, my friend. That joy is eternal. Praise the Lord. Live for that joy, not circumstantial happiness. Don't worry about self-generating joy or running after self, the self-centered life. Realize this is not short-lived. Realize that joy is eternal. So how do we finish with joy? I'll end with this. How do I finish with joy? I've got two points, and I'll end the message tonight, and we'll go home. I want to leave you with this tonight. How to finish with joy. Number one, you've got to have a start day. You'll never be able to finish unless you start. Turn with me Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by having a start day? That's the day that you and I got saved. When was that day for you? When did the race begin? When did the gun go off? When did you start running with patience? I love the uh, book of Acts, of course, and the recording of the early church in mission and the work that they were, the Lord was using them to do. And, of course, Philip is here in Samaria. He's preaching. He underwent persecution in Jerusalem, so he just felt led of the Spirit to go into Samaria and preach to them. And we see revival happening. Verse 6, and the people of uh, Acts chapter 8, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. What's going to help our nation right now? What's going to bring the spark back into lives that are listless right now? That are they're wandering from one moment of pleasure to the next. And it'll never be enough to satisfy. Why? Because they need to have a start day. And if you're sitting in here and you don't know 100% sure that when you enter eternity that you're going to be in heaven, my friend, you need to have a start day. You need a day when he asked Jesus to save you. You need a day like Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to have a day where you were born of the water. Check. We've all been born of the water. We're here. When were you born of the Spirit? When did you realize your need for the Savior? You realized we're rotten sinners, bound for Christless eternity. But then realizing what Jesus did, how he loves us this much. And if we were the only person ever created, he would have come and died just for you. He loves us. He sacrificed himself for us. And all he's waiting for us to do is look and live, to cry out to him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When was that day for you when you cried out and you had a start day? Do you remember that time? Is it a foggy memory or is it clear? If it's not clear, my friend, don't go into eternity on a baseless, uh, on, a, uh, on a very un, uh, cloudy salvation testimony. Get it settled today. No 100% sure. Have a start day. You want to finish with joy? You got to start. And then secondly, very, very simple message tonight. How do I finish with joy? Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Have the determination, like the Apostle Paul, that he, is, he was not going to let pride, problems, or people get him off the highway of faith. He was determined to finish with joy. 
My friend, you and I, we got on that highway of faith when we asked him to save us. We trusted in what he did on the cross. We didn't see the cross. We haven't seen the resurrection, but by faith, we trusted him. We had that day. But what many Christians find themselves doing is they have a day of salvation, and then they get out of the vehicle. They get off the highway. And you've seen it, and I've seen it. We all started at one point together, and then as we go, a problem came. I'm not belittling problems. Life has really high highs. Life has low lows. Life can be hard. He's always there. Trust him. Stay in that highway of faith. Is it pride? Ooh, don't let that get you off the highway of faith. Is it someone else? Oh, don't let them be the cause for you to quit on Jesus. Keep moving forward with him. Be faithful. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Twofold after that. Stay faithful in your devotion. Faithful in your devotion. We already spoke about a time in the word. We already spoke about a time in prayer. Uh, stay faithful, can I also add? We know this in scripture. Faithful to the fellowship of believers, the gathering together, the ecclesia, the called out assembly, a faith Baptist church that you find yourself in tonight. Stay faithful. Be involved. Uh, they, uh, there, there's some, they, they used to say, old preachers used to say, you need three to thrive. Well, maybe we need three just to survive, three services. Be involved. When the doors are open, try to be here. And let God work in your life, faithful in our devotion to him. And so much the more, as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, as we see the day approaching, so much the more. Faithful in our devotion faithful in our service. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says. I'm going to turn there quickly and read it and then move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 12, the Bible says, um, oh, I'm actually, I wrote down the wrong reference. I think it may be 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry. I've done that before. Anyone done that before? All right, here we go. Move forward. Says, oh, no, nope, I wrote down the wrong references altogether. We will move forward. That's why I rewrote my notes. But it's required in stewards. That's what the, what the passage that's come, that came to mind, that be found faithful. You and I are to be faithful in our service to him. We are required to do that. Twofold in that area, and I already brought it up tonight, but faithful in spreading the gospel. Telling someone else what Christ did for you and I. Telling someone else about the life that has forever been changed and how their life could be changed. How will they hear? How shall they hear? Unless there's a preacher to tell them. I love what 3 John verse 4 says. He says this, I have no greater joy. John, John the Apostle wrote this. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You want to finish with joy, my friend? Stay faithful in your devotion and stay faithful in your service. That includes telling someone else. Keep going out. The world is just going to keep getting more wicked. Newsflash. The world, has, the world has never been our friend. We're in the minority. We are. It's going to get more perverse. People are going to become more lost. There's going to be more sickness of sin. But that should not stop our hearts of compassion by going out into those highways and hedges still and compelling them to come in. Faithful in our service and spreading the gospel. Faithful in our selfless love. Loving the unlovable. Loving those because he first, he loved us. Faithful in our devotion, faithful in our service. Can I encourage you? You want to finish with joy? Have a start day and stay faithful. Is there an area in the message tonight that came to your mind and you say, oh, I'm struggling with that. Can I encourage you by testimonies of scriptures of those who failed in this? King Saul, he started well, fell off the rails. King Joash, he started well but he fell off the rails. King Uzziah started well, fell off the rails. Demas forsook Paul. Let that not be our testimony. Let's move forward for the Lord. Maybe I'm preaching a message just for me, but can I encourage you? you want to finish with joy? If you haven't, get a start date settled today. And then secondly, stay faithful. Don't live for the world's pleasures. Live for the eternal. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes? We're going to go into a time of invitation. I don't know about you, but 
It's convicting. We live lives and some, from Sunday or Sunday to Wednesday, Wednesday to Sunday, get off the rails sometimes. I'm guilty of that. Let's repent. Let's get back to where God wants us to be. But let me start off with this tonight. I wonder if there's someone here in this room. You haven't had a start day. You don't know if eternity came knocking at your door tonight. If you went into that car accident, you don't know if you'd wake up in heaven with our Savior, with Jesus. If that's you tonight, we would, we would love for you to make that decision and get it settled once and for all. I'm going to look around the room very quickly and, and ask you do you, do you, do you not know? If you don't know, I'd love to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? I do not know if I die today if I'd go to heaven. I do not know. All right, I looked around the room. I believe we're all Christians. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on the second point, but has there been a problem in life or pride or people and there's discouragement that's come into your heart? Stay faithful. Stay faithful. How many, of you, how many of you, and we won't ask for a show of hands, but maybe we need to make a decision tonight and bring it back to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm giving this back to you, and I'm going to determine to finish with joy, just like Paul. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you'd work in this time of invitation, Lord. Help us, Lord, to make the decisions that you have for us tonight. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. And thank you that you recorded, you saw fit to record that moment in Scripture where Paul said those words. Help us, Lord, to have that same heart tonight. Could we all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed? We're going to go into a moment of invitation. The music is going to be into play. Do you need to make a decision tonight? Are you saved? You didn't raise your hand. Come down to the front. We'd love to speak to you on that. What about that point on faithfulness? Are you determined? For the word faithful, it's an active word. It's not passive. It's living a life, not just going along with the flow. Where do we find ourselves tonight? Pastor. Thank you. You can look up this way. That, that was a good challenge tonight. I certainly appreciate hearing about the ministry God's called him to, but I get encouraged by the word and challenged by that. And I hope, I hope that hit you tonight where, where you need to be hit. Is that a good way to put it? Um, just a call to faithfulness. If, if every person in this room is a believer in Jesus Christ tonight, then that second point is good for every one of us. A call to, to be faithful and to keep going what God's given us to do. Thank you for that challenge, Brother Daniel, and uh, I certainly appreciate your, your commitment to, to that. That was good, wasn't it? Um, I like the book of Acts. I love the life of Paul, and what a, what a good example for us and, and good, good message to pay attention to this evening. I hope you've met uh, Daniel today, and if you haven't, uh, please take the time to do that tonight. I will tell you that he's going to be driving back to Louisville this evening, and so if you... this. This is for some of you. This is not for all of you. Don't lock him up so nobody else can talk to him. All right? He doesn't have a whole lot of time here. Let somebody else talk to him. Um, but do get by and get, get a card, get a magnet. Um, let him know you'll be praying. He didn't mention it, but he has a sheet back there. If you'd, like to get their, if you'd like to get their newsletter, you can sign up for their email newsletter back there. Um, and I, I encourage you to do that. I'm looking forward to seeing what God does with him and his wife. We're continuing to pray for Rachel, and we look forward to hearing good updates going forward as well. Um, so pray. Pray for them if you would. It's been good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Um, Terry wrote me a note, and I'll, I'll have to follow up and see if this works. But there may be an opportunity for our church to minister to the EMS community here, um, possibly through a meal for them on, on a particular day. If you'd be interested in helping, that, that, could be a large, that could be a large undertaking. If you'd be interested in helping with that meal, if you'd see my wife so she can get a list going, I'll talk to the, 
the director and see if there's a way we can minister to them with, with a meal. Um, I don't know how that'll work. But if you're interested in doing that, please see my wife tonight so she has some folks at least she can contact. That, that'll, be a large, that'll be a large undertaking. And um, I'll see if they're interested in us reaching out. But let's be in prayer for that community, all right? Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for coming back. It's good to see you. Holiday weekend. This is a good Sunday night crowd for holiday weekend. And I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here. Hope you were encouraged. And uh, you greet our guest uh, before he heads back to Louisville tonight. All right? Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. I'm so thankful that it is quick and powerful. It's living and it goes right to our need. And all of us, Lord, especially me, need to be reminded about our faithfulness and our ongoing, our ongoing course here, Lord, to finish with joy um, and how we do that. Thank you for this message tonight from your man and your word. I pray for the Salt family and ask that you'd continue to meet all of their needs on every front. Prepare the English people to whom they're going to be ministering to receive the gospel and be saved. And Lord, I pray that as they travel, you'd keep them safe. This move back for Rachel to Montana to be with her parents in the months ahead, we pray that goes smoothly. Uh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to serve you. We pray that this week we would be faithful in doing so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.